Okay. Good evening, friends. Welcome to this Tuesday evening academic programs by Critical Care Department of Yasoda Hospitals. It has been a program for almost uh, over the last two years and so. So we bring you both the topic interest, the topic of lively happenings, along with uh, the other master classes which we do for the students. So for the last two months or so, we have seen a surge in fever cases in this part of the world. And I hope the same is happening across the India. So the fever cases has a diff different mix of combination, including we see a viral dengue, and sometimes we see a enteric fevers. Some of the cases were also a tropical like scrub and lepto. But off late in the last couple of months, we saw a surge in respiratory illnesses, upper respiratory illnesses, lower respiratory illnesses, flu-like symptoms. And in the last month or so, we received few cases which are sick to cause and need a ICU admission so some of them need HFNC, some of them need NIV, some of them need ventilation and proning. And fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, now we have a series of cases which has been referred from different parts of the, these twin states of Telugu speaking to the Yasoda group of hospitals, different units. And all these patients were not responding to either the lung protective ventilation or proning. And they were either hypoxemic to extend that these patients needed ICMO or they are hypercapnic in spite of all the measures. So they needed ICMO. So we try to bring few of those sick cases which were there in all our hospitals to bring awareness and also information sharing to all the other colleagues who are across mm -hmm. the both uh, states of this Telugu speaking and others uh, part of the India. So to bring this, we actually have uh, three uh, senior consultants in the Department of Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Kaladar, who is heading the Department of Critical Care Medicine in Malakpet, Yasoda Hospitals. We welcome you, Dr. Kaladar. And Thank we you, have uh, Dr. Nitin, who is a senior consultant in the Department of Critical Care Medicine, uh, Yasoda Hospital, High Tech City, who will bring one more case. Uh, we welcome Nitin. Thank you, sir. So we have uh, Dr. Karthik, who is a <coughs> consultant in the Department of Critical Care Medicine in Sikindrabad, Yasoda Hospital. He will also uh, bring two of his cases right now who are extremely sick on ventilator and a few of the cases who are also receiving some or other form of uh, invasive supports. So to start with, we will bring the first case from uh, Dr. Kaladar. Over to you, Dr. Kaladar, so that at the end we can have some interaction. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I will uh, present a case right now that is there in our ICU. So to start with, uh, please share the screen. I, uh, are my slides visible, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So uh, basically, this is one uh, such an article, uh, such article way, which is published recently. So this article says that uh, the viral outbreak, especially S3 and 2 uh, influenza A uh, subtype, is uh, uh, spreading rapidly and uh, it's causing more and more severe illness. So according to CDC, uh, which has published this article, mm -hmm. and it's been, if you look at uh, here in uh, ICMR also has been uh, published uh, article and uh, making aware of uh, the public that S3 and 2 has been responsible for significant, significant number of uh, flu cases recently over the past few months. So if you look at uh, this is the data, uh, it's coming up. So with this background, I will present a case which is there right now in our ICU. So this patient is a 59 year old male with uh, previous no comorbids. So he had a history of uh, travel to Mumbai five days back. He's a um, LIC employee uh, who is a senior in that uh, company. So he had to attend the meeting there and went there. After returning, he developed a fever, which was of around seven days duration when he came up uh, to us. So basically it was, it was associated with uh, cough with the scanty sputum for five days and then started with uh, shortness of breath initially with grade one and then progressed to grade four. So he was treated initially at a local hospital uh, and then uh, it, the shortness of breath was progressively worsening because of which and there was a desaturation happening at the local hospital They checked the saturation because of which he was referred to us uh, to Malakpet. So uh, what happened upon arrival, this patient, if you look at his conscious following, 
the heart rate is tachycardic, the BP on the higher side around 170 by 80, having severe tachypnea of around 38 per minute. The saturations when he came uh, shifted on oxygen support, which was around 10 liters with 70%. So he was having lungs, uh, auscultation was showing diffuse crepes all over lung fields. So initially started on uh, NIV support. If you look at his ABG, the PO2 is around uh, 50. It is with uh, around initial uh, oxygen of uh, 10 liters. So it comes around, if you look at around, uh, it will be around 60-70% of the oxygen, FIO2 is being given, which amounts to PF ratio of around 100, comes under the category of uh, severe ARDS. So with this, uh, if you look at the CT chest of him, so the on NIV support, he was there, uh, CT chest was uh, done. So after NIV, actually, saturation is a bit improved, if I were to, uh, with of course, 100%. So we were planning for intubation, CT chest was showing uh, severe bilateral consolidations. Uh, if you look at the left lung, uh, the upper lobe has been spared a bit, and right side a bit uh, lower lobe has been spared. But other than that, almost 80% of the lung has been involved. So spoke to the attendants regarding his condition, and immediately uh, we intubated this patient, rapid sequence intubation was done. So uh, initially, the BP was a bit higher side, 170 by 80. Sometimes it went up to 180 by 110. We thought whether it's a pulmonary edema kind, but of course, the CT did not show much of pulmonary edema. That is the reason we waited for some time for uh, intubation. So, but anyway, uh, uh, Tudico was showing good LV function, but lung ESG, when we looked at straight sign with air bronchogram, so uh, after intubation, this is what, 100% FiO2 also is slowly retaining his uh, carbon dioxide and then uh, PO2. Uh, is also uh, very less, 100% 66 PF ratio of 66, which is less than 100. So we took a decision of uh, uh, prone ventilating him. So we ventilated uh, for 12 hours. It is after prone ventilation, also the same kind of situation around 70, 75 was the PO2 not much improving. Uh, the saturations initially after intubation around 80, uh, 75 to 80%, then they improved up to 85 like that but still uh, is requiring significant amount of PEEP, which is around 16 to 18. So uh, with that, uh, if you, uh, with that background, we were uh, preparing, we spoke to the attendants that uh, even af after prone of 12 hours is not improving, probably uh, it may not improve and the chest, CT chest shows uh, it's a very bad infiltration, very bad consolidations, discussed about ECMO support and VV ECMO has to be initiated in this patient. So that, that's what we had a discussion, uh, pros and cons of all ECMO being explained to them. So initially, if you look at uh, the laboratory investigations, uh, it shows uh, leukopenia and there is uh, ma the thrombocytes were fine. So not leukopenia, of course, it's a normal leukocyte count, which generally fits into the category of viral infections. So all other uh, were fine, uh, except a slight elevation of uh, transaminate uh, nases of uh, LFD. But other than that, but we sent one uh, procal initially thinking because it's uh, the illness is almost around one week duration, one week to eight days. Some sometimes it being associated with uh, the uh, viral illness also being associated with secondary bacterial infection. We thought of uh, uh, doing a uh, procalstone and delete, which is showing uh, 32. That is the reason we started in broad spectrum antibiotics uh, like uh, pepercillin, tazobactam, and uh, doxycycline, thinking in lines probably typical pneumonia initially. Uh, and even we started sometime we were considering the flu ep epidemic uh, going on with uh, initially 75 MGBD and uh, later, of course, we escalated up to 150 MGBD. So uh, uh, this is how. So we initiated uh, ECMO on the next day after cloning of 12 hours has been not improved. So this is how we initiated. If you look at uh, the circuit, the draining cannula which has been put in the the femoral uh, vein, then the returning can after uh, the compound oxygenator, the returning can has been put in the right internal jugular vein. So this is how uh, in the evening of the next day, around four, uh, 14th presented, next day of 15th, he is being put on uh, uh, the uh, ECMO. So uh, with this, if you see, this is the chest X-ray, which is showing bilateral diffuse haziness, and there is a ECMO cannula in the right internal jugular vein. I think in this image, not able to see much of this. Uh, not able to delineate exactly the right femoral vein. There is a center line and uh, uh, then the, uh, actually this is, sorry, I think uh, the picture is, I think after precaution, is sorry for that. But anyway, after ECMO, basically, if you look at the ABG, which is showing uh, the PO2 of 92, this is the patient ABG. And the pre-pump, it is 40, of course, post-pump, it is post-membrane, uh, like uh, post-oxygenator, it is 4.489. So this is how. Then after uh, putting um, uh, an uh, ECMO, 
So we, next day, actually, we did a bronchoscopy because uh, uh, we thought it's better to send the sample the, from the lower respiratory tract being initiated and the ECMO is being stable. So we did a uh, the uh, uh, ball and sent for a film array panel, which has been shown influenza being detected. Other than that, nothing has been detected uh, in this. So uh, then uh, over the course of uh, days, it's, it's been almost 12 days, he's been on ventilator. So uh, slowly developed a bleeding episodes in between minor to moderate, which could be uh, controlled with uh, titration of ACT and some blood products needed. And then he had uh, the uh, rough course of developing thrombocytopenia, thought of initially, apparently this thrombocytopenia, the panel came negative. And uh, uh, then actually we uh, switched over into the bivalutin. Uh, but yeah, now actually they, yesterday he's been tracheostomized. This is after tracheostomy, if you see. So being tracheostomized, uh, he's still on uh, requiring a full ECMO support. The lungs are still stiff. If you look at, uh, one minute, sorry. So if you look at the ventilator, uh, if you parameters of uh, the compliance and all, the peak pressure is still on the higher side. And if you see p plat is also with the resting ventilator settings of around 260 ml tidal volume, which amounts to three, uh, three to four ml per kg body weight of uh, tidal volume. With that, uh, is having uh, pressures which are very high, p plat and all. So it's around day 12 ECMO. Um, we are, uh, we thought it's another uh, one week or uh, two weeks we have to see. Probably planning for repeating uh, CT chest in this patient uh, to look at uh, what is happening to the lung, whether it's he he healing to normalcy or whether it's, there is any fibrous kind of uh, thing developing in the lungs uh, so that we can plan later, whether it's a bridge to recovery or otherwise bridge to lung transplant has to be planned. That is the reason planning to once maybe one or two days planning to go for a CT uh, chest, uh, probably on the ECMO. So this is how we have been treated, uh, treating him. And thank you, sir. I, my presentation is done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kaladar, uh, for that presentation. And uh, uh, just to uh, enumerate, what was the series of cases you are right now seeing in your ICU. Is this a, a we can think about very scary phenomenon in this case, uh, who rapidly deteriorated with such a bad pneumonia, not responding to proning, needing ECMO and on ECMO also for a couple of weeks, we still are waiting for a recovery. But what about the other cases you're seeing? How are the severity? How many cases you have seen in the last couple of weeks or so? Or more? Uh, we, we, we are getting more and more respiratory illnesses cases, sir. Definitely, there is a mix of cases of a uh, tropical fever. Sometimes we are seeing like dengue cases are there, scrub typhus cases are there. Along with that, we are seeing some lepto cases. Along with that, more and more SARI cases, severe acute respiratory illnesses. Almost uh, uh, recently, previous one week, uh, most of the around 50 to 60 percent of the patients who are coming to ICU are affected with uh, severe acute respiratory illness, uh, which is from uh, requiring from oxygen to uh, almost uh, like uh, ECMO support as we see in this case. So oxygen support, HFNC, some people are recovering most of the times uh, with HFNC and NIV. These, these are the subset of patients they are requiring. And among them, most of the times, as I was telling recently, slowly the influenza has been, uh, has been detected. Uh, at our center uh, in Sareshoda hospital, we are doing any, uh, anyway, the influenza panel, which uh, shows H3N2 also. So uh, sometimes uh, it's been detected, sometimes influenza is coming positive if we are sending film array panel who's been intubated. Some patients being pro prone ventilated, yeah, some, uh, some patients do respond to the prone ventilation well after three or four prones, uh, they, they've been uh, weaned off and then extubated. Uh, but this is one such case uh, is not responded. Some patients are presenting with even myocarditis and uh, uh, then uh, landing up in multi-organ dysfunction, not able to save them. So this is how the pattern of cases that are coming to uh, ICU. Sir. Okay, we will uh, move on to the next presentation by Dr. Karthik. Uh, Dr. Karthik, over to you. Sure, thank you, sir. Uh, full screen, please. Sir, uh, visible, sir. Yes. Yeah. 
thank you sir thank you for giving me an opportunity to present a case and uh, uh, speak about i'll uh, speak about a case which we have gone through in the recent uh, and this, this this patient is still in our icu and uh, i'll give you a rough idea of what cases we are dealing in our uh, setup and all so there was a 24 year old uh, young female with nil comorbids presented with a history of fever associated with cough and myalgia which is a very common presentation in this rainy season she went to a local hospital they thought it is a simple uh, uh, dengue or a simple uh, tropical fever uh, or a malaria and then they have treated her with antibiotics and anti uh, uh, at a local uh, uh, practitioner later on day five she gradually had a shortness of breath uh, slowly which was worsening and she had myalgia which was continuously increasing and uh, later it gradually progressed to grade four and uh, then she went back to the same local area and they referred uh, her to us but, uh, unfortunately at the presentation this patient uh, while traveling from a distance of around 150 kilometers away from our setup to uh, come here her saturation was 60 percent in room air immediately in er she was uh, initiated with oxygen support uh, putting in niv and uh, her room air sat and with oxygen her saturation was 85 percent and uh, she was very tachypnic she was intubated immediately uh, her abg was showing uh, severe uh, 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 ARDS picture with PF ratios of less than 100 and uh, she was immediately rolled in into the CT scan where uh, uh, we have seen her CT scan in uh, this way. Is a video uh, visible, sir? Yes. Yeah. yes. So she was showing bilateral, severe, dense, consolidatory picture with a very few minimal GGOs like shown below. Uh, later, uh, we shifted her into the ICU. In the ICU, keeping in mind about her severe ARDS single organ, she was hemodynamically holding on with a very low saturation, sir. Then we proned her, sir. Uh, on uh, day one, we proned her. Uh, ARDS ventilation according to ARDS.net protocol was initiated. And even on prone also, she was not maintaining saturations well. She was uh, put on antibiotics, doxycycline and fluvir, thinking about community acquired as well as atypical and viral infections, which are very common in these uh, clinical scenarios. And filimare was sent, a filimare panel was sent. So it showed influenza A positive. Our uh, time for uh, getting a filimare panel in our setup is nearly four to five hours. So we could uh, isolate the organism very early in this patient. She was hemodynamically stable, prone, uh, but uh, after proning for two or three cycles also, she was a prone non-responder gradual increase in the peep was requirement was there we sat down with the family more score was greater than three still ards was uh, severe ards was there so we spoke to the family we initiated her on vv ecmo after initiating her on vv ecmo day three of day two of vv ecmo she started having fever spikes and uh, then our antibiotics we escalated from piperacillin tazobactam to uh, meropenem and minocycline and we have sent cultures for her, sir. So in this patient, we had a co-infection with uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, Astinobacter, and influenza A, which was again, uh, 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 which again came positive on uh, PAL cultures also. So after initiating ECMO, even on ECMO, we did proning for this patient uh, to see whether it will help. And a uh, few of our patients previously, which we have done proning on ECMO, we have uh, successfully decanulated them. And uh, two patients, we have uh, done lung transplant and then decanulated them. Still on ECMO also, unfortunately, this patient was a non-responder and uh, the PF ratios uh, were not improving. Uh, later, she had mild thrombocytopenia. We thought it was a hit versus sepsis. Fevers were continuing. There was no other organ dysfunction except for the uh, lung. So on ECMO, we rolled her into the CT scan again uh, on day 11. So on day 11, unfortunately, when we have done a CT scan, we have found a large cavitatory lesions bilaterally. So we were in suspicion with aspergillosis and all. We sent, we did a ball again. Uh, ball galactomenon was showed positive. The smear showed branching septate uh, hyphae. And uh, in cultures, asthmobacter and aspergillosis came to be positive. She was started on poly B and ampho B. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even today, the patient is in our uh, setup where severe hypoxemia is there. Her P-membrane oxygenation is still 
55 PAO2s are still 55. Thrombocytopenia is uh, persistent. She is very ECMO dependent. Uh, we are counseling the patient uh, based on the uh, uh, fungal infection and all the co-infections uh, co which this patient has uh, uh, guided to poor prognosis. We are giving our best effort to get her out. We are uh, we have put her on uh, amphotericin B, minocycline, and miropinum. Uh, this was our first case, which is still we are fighting for uh, her recovery. Uh, second, uh, one other case, which uh, generally nearly 50% of our ICU cases are filled up with all uh, respiratory tract infections. Out of these 50%, nearly around 15 to 20% are H3 entry positive in this season. So there are lots of cases which had varied presentation with, uh, uh, severe, uh, with severe ARDS to mild to moderate ARDS. We have seen lots of mild to moderate ARDS patients uh, who were recovering on HFNC alone, who were uh, recovering with BiPAP and a few of the patients which we had, uh, they, uh, they were very good responders to prone ventilation and ARDS ventilation. For all these patients, uh, what I personally think was Osaltamivir, which is the only drug which we had against H3N2 uh, or uh, the influenza A that was helpful and lots of patients who were initiated early, came to the hospitals early within the first two, three days of the illness had a good response. Patients with multiple comorbids, multi-organ dysfunctions who presented very late in the second or the end of the first week of illness had a, a guided to a poor outcome. Uh, in the last two months, uh, in July and August, uh, taking all the uh, respiratory tract infections apart from the uh, community acquired pneumonia, what we had was around 28 patients were H3N2, were influenza A actually. And in August, we had 17, influenza B3 and 6. COVID, we had one in July and uh, none in August. Sir. So I would uh, conclude this uh, case presentation with saying that everybody, please arm yourself against the flu with influenza vaccine. Every patient above, every person above six months of age, kindly get your uh, flu shot. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Karthik, for that presentation. Uh, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Karthik, sir. how are you actually you are managing this H3N2 cases and what is your management strategy in your ICU? Uh, what is the difference between uh, the previous way? Is it the remaining the same standard care? How do you manage? Sir, uh, uh, first and foremost, most of the cases which we are receiving right now, we are doing a film array panel to identify it as early as possible, sir. Starting them on Osaltamivir is one other thing. Similar to the ARDS pictures, we are proning them regularly. If they are on mild to moderate ARDS pictures, we are using HFNC and NIV, sir. HFNC, the compliance of the patient is better and they are uh, recovering well with HFNC also, sir. But patients with severe ARDS, early ECMO has shown some benefit in our setup, sir. And two, three patients, we have gone to lung transplant, sir. Even they are doing good, sir. The out this, this year, H3N2? Sir, this year, H2, H3N2 has be, been nearly 50 to 60% of my respiratory. Are this year's patients went into the lung transplants? Uh, this year, yes, sir. One patient has gone into lung transplants, sir. Oh, yes, uh, undergone a lung transplant. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, so empirical, the, the things which you are mentioning is right now, uh, we are seeing a surge in se severe acute SARI cases, the severe yes, acute respiratory illness cases, and most of them are influenza A. Yes, and sir. your data is more specific that it is H3N2 because you do the panel. Yes, sir. We have specify it. the serotype. And uh, that's what has been also ICMR reporting. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the CDC talks about or WHO talks about that H3N2, the severity is many, manifold and the infectivity is also high across the globe, not just in India. The H3N2 variants, both uh, the severity and the uh, infectivity is high and more common so in uh, children age group or neonatal age group to the elderly age group and immunocompromised host. Uh, to the pregnancies. So, any exposure of uh, the children's and pregnancy in your units or your uh, one patient uh, with uh, pregnancy, she has presented uh, uh, in her uh, uh, third week. Sorry, in her third month of pregnancy, she has presented with uh, influenza A, sir. 
and one patient postpartum she has presented sir we thought it was a hospital acquired infection uh, postpartum she presented sir in the last one month and children uh, yes sir, most of them are uh, suffering with flu sir uh, that we have uh, no data in contrary to what we have seen in covid not many hospitalization with the child child age group or yes. less than 14 age group but influenza has a different ball game where we have seen more and more children and elderly age group coming with, with uh, influenza like illness along with uh, the regular age groups yes thank you karthik in bringing the cases uh, now back to dr nitin over to you nitin for your case thank you sir uh, so i will be presenting a case uh, which is present in our hospital in our uh, unit now So good evening, everyone. Myself, Dr. Nathan. So I am the consultant in the Department of Critical Care in Ashoka Hospital, High Tech City. So here we have a case who is a 45-year-old uh, female patient, Nil Kumars, who is hailing from uh, Guntur, <coughs> came to our hospital with complaints of shortness of breath, grade 4, and fever on and off, and dry cough since 6 September 2023. Initially, she got admitted to the above hospital with the local complaints where she got treated symptomatically with uh, paracetamol but her symptom didn't subside. Later, she was admitted to another hospital locally in which she was admitted from 12th to 21st, almost for nine days. She had no exposure of any uh, travel history, but she had exposure that her uh, grandchild was admitted with viral LRTA, which turned out to be H1N1 positive. So she had exposure there. And later on, she had symptoms of uh, dry cough and fever since then. So there in the local hospital, she was diagnosed as bilateral pneumonia with respiratory failure and the respiratory panel which was sent there came out to be influenza A positive. She was treated there symptomatically with IV antibiotics, uh, piperacillin with uh, piperacillin tazobactam and tablet oseltamivir was uh, given for nine days with bronchodilators, steroids, antipyretics and she was started on NIV support with the uh, with, uh, oxygenation with the FAO2 of around 60 to 70 percent and other supportive care. In view of her uh, respiratory distress, she was intubated, kept on ventilator support, and later she was shifted to our unit for further management. So this was the initial X-ray when she got admitted to the hospital there. So as you can see uh, in the X-ray, we could see there's bilateral uh, basal consolidator with the uh, GGOs, especially more on the right side compared to the left. And on, this was on 14. On 15th and 16th, we could see a slight improvement in the X-ray films. And on the say 17th and 18th also, we could see the same. But later on, 19th and 20th and 21st, we could see there is gradual worsening of the X-rays and gradual deterioration of her respiratory parameters. And uh, this was on day 9. On day 9, till day 9, she was on NIV support. So she got intubated on day 9 and later she got shifted to us. So this was the CT chest which was done on 21st before shifting to our hospital. As you could see, there was a gradual progression of the disease involvement of the, all the lung fields. We could see generalized GGOs with uh, septal thickenings and uh, basal consolidatory pattern. So upon presentation to our ER, the patient was on mechanical ventilatory support. The lungs, we could uh, auscultate there were basal crypts were present. She was tachycardic on sedation. She was requiring minimal norad support. Her BP was around 110 by 80. Her 2D equal study was normal. This was the initial ABG, which was done in the ER. On 100% FAO2, we could see there is a pH was around 7.19 with a PCO2 of 56. It is a PEO2 of 55 with a mild increase in the creatinine of 1.12. And her PF ratio was 55 on 100% FAO2. And this was the CT chest, which was done before shifting to, the, to our ICU. So we could see the same pattern, bilateral uh, dense consolidation in the basal with uh, B GGOs with septal thickenings, the same. And on day one, she was started on uh, ARDS ventilation and in view of her uh, low PF ratios, with uh, we offered her a one cycle of prone ventilation was done. Slowly, we could taper off the norad, her tachycardia settled. Empirically, she was started on uh, injection meropenem, tablet oseltamil was planned and continued till day 14, another supportive care. And this was the ABG on prone ventilation. So her pH was around 6.9 with a PF ratio of uh, 9 to 100 percent FAO2. And her uh, P plaques were more than 36, and her driving pressure was more than 20. So the blood ET and urine cultures were sent along with other basic investigations. This was the uh, uh, later ABGs, which we done as eta early. So the PF ratio slightly improved to 86, and later it was 113 on prone ventilation. But we could see there is a uh, 
uh, permissive hypercapnia with a pH of still 7.1 and a slight increase in the creatinine of uh, 1.37 to 1.58. So the basic class which we sent came out to be a uh, total count was around 30,000. But in the peripheral smear, we could see there was no septic features per se. And uh, her INR was 1.22 with a slight increase in the creatinine of 1.2 and the mild transaminitis was there. And we treated accordingly with uh, uh, hepatoprotective medications and everything. So on day two, we could see she was not maintaining her oxygenation on prone ventilation. Even with 100% FAO2, her p plates were more than 30, driving pressure was more than 15, her PF was around 113. The family was counseled about the same and discussed about initiation of early ECMO. And the ECMO was initiated early with uh, VV ECMO and it was uneventful. So this was the first ECMO which has been initiated in high-tech city unit. So as you could see, uh, so this is the ECMO circuit and uh, you could see the patient is on uh, sedation and uh, paralysis and uh, this is on the mechanical ventilatory support. So this is the day one of uh, cannulation. Uh, this was the initial ABG. So we, this is a pre-membrane, the post-membrane, the pre-membrane PO2 was in 43 and the PO2 on the post-membrane is 452. In the FIO2, in the PO2, in the PF ratio, uh, upon initiation of ECMO, the PF ratio was 166. So the serial labs, what we could see was there is a gradual decrease in the TLC on the day two, but uh, there was a slight increase in the TLC count. But in the peripheral smear, we couldn't find any septic features per se. And her cultures were also came out to be sterile. Slowly, we plan was to de-escalate on meropinum. There was a increase, slight increase in the creatinine because we our plan was to decongest the patient with injection LASIX infusion. But uh, later on, we could we stopped it and we could achieve a negative balance of around uh, three liters on uh, day two. And slightly, there was a decrease in the uh, transaminases level. So at present, this is the uh, day four of ECMO. And uh, as you can see, there is a slight improvement in the X-ray. There is a per se on the left side compared to the right side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Nitin, for that presentation. Uh, uh, Nitin, what is your experience in your part of ICU? Uh, how many cases you are seeing right now as a respiratory illness or sari cases? How sick are they? Uh, what is their uh, that, um, course in your ICU? Sir, in the, in the last three months, we could see there is an increase in the case of uh, viral illness, sir. So we could see like uh, dengue, then uh, yeah, and this one H1N1 and H1N1 leading to with LRTA, pneumonias and ARDS. What we, what we could see was especially uh, even with the patient with comops or nil comops, there is a good outcome with a, most of the patients, almost like 60-70% uh, of the patient requiring only NIV support and slowly weaning off to a face mask and slowly weaning off to a nasal pulse. But the other 30%, what we could see was uh, these patients who are having a comorbs with other uh, an immunocompromised patient, we could see they are landing up in ARDS, requiring some two to three sessions of prone ventilation. And slowly the, we could wean off from the ventilatory support, requiring a trichosmia and uh, pushing them to rehab. Not all patients uh, required ECMO, sir, in our unit. And uh, compared to the COVID, where we could see there is a gradual uh, progression of the disease, a patient landing up in cytokine storm, leading to worsening of organ dysfunction and uh, requiring all the vasopressor support. H1N1, what we could see was patients who present early, who presented, who we could uh, use oseltamivir in the early phase, they responded well compared to the other patients who presented late. Okay. Uh, do we have Madhusudan on board? Can we actually make him panelist? Is he on board? Sir, I wanted to show one more thing, sir. Where oh, yeah. it, uh... So, Sir, you are good. Wherein even in ECMO also, sir, we could prone some patients, sir, in our ICUs, mm -hmm. where this is a setup and this is a prone patient, uh, sir. We have seen few patients who have responded to prone ventilation previously, sir. Uh, not in H1, but H1 uh, influenza, but we have done it for a bacterial pneumonia, sir. So they have shown response uh, and uh, recovery after in prone ventilation on ECMO, sir. So there are questions related to uh, steroid role. Uh, Kaladar, you want to answer that? Yes, sir. Uh, I, uh, as such, actually speaking, uh, there is no role of steroid in uh, influenza. So most of the trials, what uh, they did is the outcome was uh, poor. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, as compared to COVID, where uh, the role of steroid is there when they become uh, critically ill and they need oxygen therapy. So, but influenza, as of now, the data say, says, and we generally don't use uh, the uh, uh, steroids, at least initial part of the infection. But uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, probably once you cover with tocilizumab for maybe five days and all, suppose uh, if you think still hyperinflammatory response is going on and uh, the procastron is not much, at some point, uh, uh, maybe we can add uh, the uh, steroid as part of uh, the early RDS protocol, where generally in early RDS, we do give steroids, they, they, they do respond. Uh, that's what my opinion is. Yeah. So in influenza, I think H1N1, H3N2, uh, we don't have any uh, literature or evidence supporting the role of steroids in recovery. In fact, we have uh, uh, evidences Against. They're against the use of steroids. So uh, many of our patients for whom we actually intubate, ventilate, prone them, they recover so well without any role of steroids. We have an example already which Karthik has presented in a patient who was actually uh, just ventilated, prone and been put on ICMO, has developed a cavitatory lesion with aspergillosis. And for, I don't know, for a change uh, always influenza has been more associated with uh, secondary bacterial pneumonias along with strep pneumonia, staphylococcus, and some of them were aspergillosis as he rightly put across. We have not seen much of mucors, uh, what we have seen, uh, contrary to what we have seen right now in influenza, we have seen more mucors in uh, COVID pan uh, patterns than uh, what we are seeing in influenza. So influenza is more associated with bacterial pneumonias also uh, with the aspergillosis. So without even steroids only, we are seeing uh, aspergillosis cavities coming in two weeks time, Karthik or three weeks time. So this is the third week which we have seen, sir. And there was nothing uh, in the previous CT. No, sir. Done. No. And all of a sudden, all of them developed in after ventilation and all this. Yes, sir. So, uh, so that is a uh, phenomenon which is concerning. And uh, probably uh, the information right now, the reason why we try to bring is uh, fortunately or unfortunately in the current, all the units of uh, Yasoda group of hospital, we have patients who are in very severe ARDS and all of these patients who have not responded to conventional ventilation, not responded to prone ventilation and been referred to us from different parts of the state or different areas of the state uh, and all of them were initiated on a VV ICMO. All the three cases which we presented were uh, initiated on VV ICMO. And all of them are in either in the first week, second week, and third week. If I see the uh, the case which Dr. Nitin presented from high tech is in the first week, uh, and Kaladar is in second week, and you are talking about a patient who is in third week. And we hope and pray these patients' lungs slowly recover because contrary to what we have seen in COVID, uh, the lung fibrosis or the lung compliances or the lung uh, end stage lung issues are not so common like what we have seen in COVID. So we hope these patients will recover and not land up in those, those stages and slowly can come out. So what we have done, uh, uh, Kaladar and um, uh, Karthik and Nitin, so in these patients, we also looked at volume status in them. Are they volume logged or we try to make them even balance or slightly negative balance to see whether this is helping because uh, when you actually ventilate with resting lung with a, a minimum tidal volumes, minimum plateaus, minimum uh, driving pressure, sometimes we see these patients go into atelectatic lung changes and also with little bit of uh, overloaded volume states can leak into them. So we try to do that also in one of our patients. So this has been a challenge to all of us and I think the same thing is happening across uh, the both states. But these are the very sick patients. These are the extreme cases which we presented. But this is just a tip of iceberg where many other cases which were presented to the OPDs and, uh, and very few of them, maybe less than 10% who are requiring admissions in the ward or room side. And very few of them, maybe uh, less than 5% are requiring ICU stay. And in them, maybe uh, some of those percentage of patients who actually gets intubated, uh, we see this seriousness. The purpose of this uh, uh, webinar is to create a kind of uh, awareness and information that 
the current influenza a can be because of h3 and 2 and this h3 and 2 can be sometimes they be uh, so severe and so serious that we may need to uh, intubate them early prone them early if they are not responding probably we may need to uh, put on an early vv ecmo and we all understand the vv ecmo indication is not uh, after the failing everything and after ventilating for 5 to 7 days on proning mm -hmm. but if i need a uh, lung ventilation which is exceeding my protective lung strategy suppose i need a plateau pressures of more than 30 or 35 if i need a driving pressure of more than 15 or 20 which uh, uh, dr nitin was talking about then probably i am in a position to initiate a early vv ecmo if uh, we all understand the context in india where uh, affordability and uh, consent and the situation other all things also take into account but if they are uh, affordable and they are willing for then early vv ecmo in them where they are not responding to conventional proning and you are crossing your uh, protective lung ventilation that is the time where we should initiate because after five to seven days of very um, uh, what you say uh, high pressure ventilation with uh, higher driving pressure higher plateau pressures your lung injuries with willy uh, damages extensively and after that initiating ECMO uh, becomes a tricky and uh, uh, many of the situation we forced to start but the outcomes are as all of you uh, talked about is difficult in them. Uh, I, I think with this uh, any questions? Sir, yeah. regarding, sorry. sorry. Regarding infection control uh, precautions sir I think uh, that also I think most of the people might be want like infection control especially the vaccine the role of vaccines so i think uh, as we had seen uh, more and more in covid uh, cases like uh, during covid pandemic when we had uh, most of the healthcare professionals uh, taken the vaccines uh, got protected very well the same thing here applies uh, to even uh, influenza so the influenza generally the vaccine uh, contains quadrivalent vaccine which is uh, influenza a subtype h1 n1 h1 n2 h3 n2 and influenza b so if uh, I think yearly there is a update on this uh, vaccine, like the recent strain they incorporate in that, which will be most of the times released in the month of September and all, probably that, that is where the uh, slowly the influenza illnesses uh, start. Probably all the healthcare professionals who are involved, especially right from emergency to uh, intensive care unit, uh, all the doctors and nurses, if they get vaccinated, they will be protected well. Along with them, uh, among uh, the patients who are, as uh, we were discussing about the patients who are immunosuppressed, uh, post transplants, uh, those who are having chronic lung diseases like COPD, bronchial asthma, and the children of uh, around uh, two years, more than two years generally it is recommended, and more than 60 years or 65 years of elderly people. These are the sub, uh, subgroup of people who, if they take uh, every annually the influenza vaccine properly, they will get protected very well. And uh, regarding infection control precautions uh, in hospital or in uh, at home also, it has like uh, wearing mask and the regular uh, face mask uh, as compared to N95 as we were using more and more during uh, the COVID uh, gives equal protection probably uh, the patient and the who is attending the doctor and nurses have to wear uh, uh, their face mask uh, without any uh, like interruption uh, while carrying these patients also helps in uh, because it is a droplet spread and aerosol spread. So that will definitely will prevent infection among the others. Even at home, if one person get affected, isolate himself and wear mask while uh, coming out and all, also helps a lot. Probably infection control precautions, yes, and hygiene, of course, uh, plays a central role everywhere. So infection control precautions are also essential and very crucial uh, aspect uh, as far as I feel uh, for prevention of this infection. So you say ki vaccinate all healthcare professionals, vaccinate high risk group. That's a one model of uh, prevention. The other you are saying ki you have influenza appropriate behavior, like what we had a COVID appropriate behavior, at least for them, uh, those who are in high risk. Yes. We're talking about elderly, we're talking about immunocompromised host, we're talking about those who are a structural lung disease. These are all sure. groups and pregnancy. Probably you people at least avoid crowded places avoid uh, the places where there is somebody who is symptomatic and if possible use a at least a regular uh, a surgical or a medical mask uh, when you are actually 
visiting these places or healthcare setting at this in this point of time to avoid this i think that there is an, another, another interesting point which actually i think um, you or kartik covered that's related to oseltamivir okay the we we know there are the two drugs which we now cover uh, the current influenza that is either influenza uh, a h1n1 or influenza h3n2 uh, both of them are either covered by janamivir or oseltamivir currently many of our units including us we are using oseltamivir and the dose varies between 75 mg uh, bd to a 150 mg bd so but i find these drugs have more evidence to be treated in the early first 48 hours is the effective time and after 48 hours the role of these drugs are always questioned even though many of us use because we are helpless we don't have any other options to treat antimicrobial don't help we may start these drugs but the role after 48 hours is always questioned and probably beyond 5 days i think it has nothing to do even some of our clinicians use but the role is always been questioned but yes symptomatically what we have observed in opd patients in ip patients and in uh, e even in families when oseltamivir is used in uh, high risk groups if it started in the day one of this illness uh, the symptomatology the duration of illness all been uh, early uh, contained and corrected dr madhu you have been uh, witnessing dr madhu is our head of the department in yasoda hospital secunderabad what is your experience right now with the current influenza outbreak with the h3n2 being predominant i think dr karthik showed your institutional data which suggest uh, almost all of your influenza cases uh, which are h3n2 which you would actually type uh thank you venkat uh, actually the thing is that <clears throat> previously what uh, epidemic we used to see we used to see the cases which are coming in isolation now what present we are seeing the cases are there the patients are coming with co infections also patients are coming with a tropical fever and along with influenza both combinations are there for the patients second important thing is there uh, for the influenza is high degree of suspicion is very important and i think uh, all our my colleagues has mentioned uh, starting an early treatment for the patient it not only helps for the patient for shedding of the viruses if you are starting early treatment shedding of viruses will come down and at the same time infectivity also will come down for the patient that is very important is there so the reason the role is there for this patient to start an empirical treatment of oseltamivir that is important and subsequently the you have to send the panel and confirm it the continuing with the other thing for the patient these patients are the as the most of my colleagues have told around more than 60 70% patients we are treating on op basis 20 to 30% patients are coming either in hdu or ward and out of that 5 to 10% patients are becoming sick mm -hmm. the reason we have to keep high degree of suspicion starting the treatment now regarding the treatment a lot of people told about uh, the oseltamivir is the drug of choice the doses are given 75 and what we are doing at our experience is there once we are seeing confirmatory and the patient having more involvement is there we are increasing the dose to 150 and we wanted to get an experience by using this 150 mg twice daily dose whether going effective or not some of the patient where ct scan we seen is quite bad uh, ct scan we cannot believe that patient will be spontaneous breathing that patient be managed on hfnc with higher dose of the oseltamivir 150 mg for more th more than 10 days shown better improvement and patient was discharged from the hospital also and only the word of caution for all the people is there about the steroids because you have been used to for the covid so much commonly thing is there thinking about all the people starting the steroids and uh, we had some cases uh, some of the people had tried steroids on the outside and secondary we seen the patients are getting some fungal infections are there though they had a short exposure of the cases of two or three days only but the patient referred outside or in the hospital also some of the people thinking that maybe a patient not responding to the medications just give a trial of steroids that patients are quite bad and even that patients are nicmo also not helping so we have uh, dr srikant sastrabuddha asking about uh, the dose age and duration of uh, steroids which can attribute to have a secondary bacterial infection i think so uh, my point will be some something like that without even we see any steroid use Uh, some of the cases in h1n1 h3n2 get uh, bacterial co infection and it's not contrary to what we have seen in covid where in covid we saw second week third week also we hardly had any added an infection but here in uh, influenza we see uh, strep pneumonia staph 
or sometimes hospital acquired infections add on as early as uh, in the first or second weeks as many of our colleagues mentioned. Aspergillosis has also been commonly associated even without involvement of steroid. Mm -hmm. Now his question of use of dose and the duration, we all understand the lower dose and shorter duration is never has been associated with increased risk of uh, any immunocompromised states. But the higher the doses, when we exceed a half a milligram per kg to one milligram per kg and above, and when it, the duration exceeds five to for a probably 10 days, your risk of a further uh, bacterial infection or a fungal infection goes up. Any role of tocilizumab, Dr. Kaladar, you want to answer any role of tocilizumab? Yeah, no role, sir. No role of tocilizumab. This, this was being used in during especially first wave of uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So, but yeah, definitely it was associated with significant, some patients, of course, uh, there was a significant turnaround, they, they improved, we don't know whether it was tocilizumab and all, we, we, we prone to such patients. But definitely it's a profound immunosuppressive drug where uh, they will be associated with uh, typical, as we are discussing more and more about fungal infections, they typically land up in severe uh, secondary bacterial infections and even uh, fungal, especially we had seen mucormycosis uh, after they received uh, the tocilizumab and uh, the lineage, uh, the other uh, type of drugs of uh, monoclonal antibodies outside they used to use. So after that, they landed up in uh, severe mucor and uh, uh, the rhinocerebral and even lung uh, mucors and renal mucors we had seen after uh, receiving this uh, monoclonal antibodies like uh, tocilizumab. I, yeah, uh, that is what the experience in COVID. But definitely uh, in influenza, there is no data and it's I feel it's uh, definitely contraindicated. So we will uh, take Dr. Srikant Sastrabuddhi. Can we actually give uh, Dr. Srikant Sastrabuddhi online? With, can we make him panelist so that he can give a comment? He's been a part of it. So any uh, comments from your side, uh, Dr. Nitin, on uh, current status and current management? Any tech message you want to give? So nothing, sir. First of all, is uh, there was one question which we said pre uh, prophylaxis for antiviral. There is no like uh, thing like pre exposure prophylaxis of using oseltamivir, and uh, post exposure also we have to use within forty eight hours for the oseltamivir to be effective. And uh, seventy five mg and one fifty mg BD dose of oseltamivir. There is not much of any difference of using any seventy five mg or one fifty mg. And uh, for complicated cases, we usually use for more than ten days of oseltamivir. But uh, the thing is, it doesn't uh, reflect on the mortality, but it decreases the length of stay and it decreases the viral shedding per se. So, Srikant, sir, welcome you on board. It's a yeah. pleasure for us to you to be on board. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank so you so much. Continue Thank your you. comment. We do want your inputs from there on uh, the usage of steroid and its implication. Yeah, no, it was, uh, first of all, at the outset, I would like to thank you for your consistency. Uh, uh, the content, uh, the regularity, and the quality of your masterclass, which is uh, which is uh, so very important for all of us. And uh, uh, I just wanted to actually kind of ask for the benefit of the others as well as for myself that we keep on discussing about steroids. That is something the drug which uh, is always. Uh, you know, proved to be a double-edged sword, and uh, more often we we uh, kind of as a desperate situation we may use it. Uh, I'm not discussing uh, its role in influenza or the H1N1 and H3N2 which we discussed, and that is that message was very loud and clear by you, and I'm sure everyone would have got it. But uh, uh, as far as the steroids are concerned, in general in ICU, as we are always scared about something which we don't as an intensivist or clinician don't you know pour oil into the burning uh, fire which is already uh, uh, which is already going on in any patient who is sick uh, i would probably say that uh, it's just for a basic understanding for someone who is uh, who are students or or uh, you know fellows that we consider hydrocortisone as a as a point one reference and then uh, uh, prednisolone would be four points or four times potent than hydrocort and with methylprednisolone about five times and dexa as we know as the most potent about 20 times so from whatever i could learn and i, I remember that we have a steroid which is uh, which is equivalent to a prednisolone or a methylprednisolone 
dose of as you correctly said i think 1 mg per kg uh, per day for 3 uh, weeks in continuation can pose the risk for uh, uh, the secondary infection especially the bacteria as well as the fungus uh, that is what i just thought uh, I, i would Uh, very correctly pointed out, sir. That somewhere goes between one five six twenty, as you say. Yes. We, we talk about fifty milligrams uh, Q six hourly, or total of three hundred milligrams hydrocortisone as a stress dose in all septic uh, conditions where uh, our vasopressors are not helping in maintaining the map, which can yes. be using. Correlate right. around forty to sixty milligrams of uh, prednisolone to methyl prednisolone. That's where we say that right. almost it's so. Oh, but in a chronic use, I think we, these are all talking about short use. Like we say, right. something between three days, five days. The moment your vasopressors taper, you drop them down. But right. when we are talking about a longer use, probably where we are talking about weeks together, four weeks or more. So three weeks, yeah. Ah, uh, three weeks or more. We say somewhere about prednisolone of ten milligrams and more for a longer period may also cause uh, equivalent uh, effects on the risking the patients. Maybe uh, I think there will be a Uh, thin layer between a like short use and a longer term use, but this is what yes. in intensive care units we all probably use the stress dose correlates right. with somewhere point five milligrams to one milligram per kilogram of uh, right. prednisolone or prednisolone. Thank right. you, thank you, sir. Yeah, I would just like to uh, uh, kind of say hi to my friend Madhusudan. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there was a question from Santosh. He spoke about. Uh, A screening uh, with a fungal infection, aspergillosis, on suspected high risk group. Uh, uh, Karthik, any points on that? Yes, sir. Uh, for every patient, we don't screen, sir. But for patients with high risk of uh, uh, inf fungal infections, like patients who are immunocompromised, post transplant, solid organ transplant, post bone marrow transplant, or patients who are on steroids for previous any other rheumatic arthritis or something like that, or patients who are diabetic, and per se. Severe pneumonia is also a risk factor for a uh, invasive aspergillosis. I think uh, Karthik is also asking, and in, in this context, when you are yes. intubating, ventilating patients with ARDS with influenza, do you screen for fungal infections? No, sir. If it is refractory, then we screen for uh, in a bowel sample. Sir. So uh, that's probably the answer. That uh, uh, in initial phase, most of the times the regular uh, gram stain and fungal stain go, yes, but sir. we look at more seriously when a patient who has a h1n1 ards and after proning or after icmo the patient was on a uh, up uh, upward uh, recovery and at some point after a couple of days or three days we see the patient's clinical condition deteriorates acutely by oxygenation lung condition pf ratios x ray radiologically then we know it was not just h1n1 there is second thing added the acute deterioration need to be explained that is the point where i feel we need to be more careful about the secondary infections in the form of bacterials and also fungals so there Can is I... a... yeah yeah sir please venkat if you don't mind so uh, just as regards to fungal infection which you, uh, which in this case we were discussing about the first case i suppose where the galactomannan was positive so there is a reasonable evidence of uh, addition of a, a, a liposomal amphotericin b, uh, a liposomal amphotericin b along with echinocandin i think in your case voriconazole was started but uh, uh, if you really see the literature uh, there is de there is a certain evidence about addition of echinocandin uh, and shifting the patient to uh, liposomal amphotericin b as as a uh, as a salvage therapy and in few cases the posaconazole uh, which also has been tried uh, for uh, for aspergillus especially uh, if not for mucor but uh, there has been few papers on posaconazole so you are take on that yeah true so uh, the conventional therapy or choice uh, would have been a voriconazole iv but as you rightly pointed out in the patients where we have uh, fumigators of flabus and we are now seeing a resistant uh, pathogens also in them so amphotericin choice uh, has been uh, in up, uh, escalation to that echinocandins comes as a add on uh, therapy uh, when uh, you are none of the other things are helping and there is other reasons when these amphotericin also been preferred in these situations 
that is when i don't have a clue whether it is a mucor or aspergillosis i have a cavity i have a fungal lesion i'm not convinced enough either of them and i'm starting and i'm not able to do a bronch or ball and True. there is another alternative choice that isovaconazole coming to the fosaconazole uh, yes we used fosaconazole in few of the situations with a mucor in combination uh, to amfo and in but in uh, aspergillosis the fosaconazole use was Uh, after the voriconazole only amfo was a preferred choice but fosaconazole was used more for mucor in combination or a continuation of therapy uh, not as an initial therapy and more so when we had a, uh, more so when we had a, a mucor uh, pandemic along with uh, mucor overload along with covid at that time there was a limitation of supply of amfo b there was a lot of uh, problems with uh, uh, availability of amfotericin b and fosaconazole was only a rescue therapy at that time isovaconazole was also not available in indian context so right now we choose sometimes isovaconazole in patient who had a renal impairment in patients where i am not sure about either of them is uh, dealing and i am also having a problem with drug drug interaction probably isovaconazole can come as a layer uh, there so with this i thank all of you uh, for this uh, presentation and bringing this cases and i think this is what is happening right now and all the cases which are presented today are uh, live and on the icu beds in all our units uh, with a, a four icmos four to five icmos running in all our units i hope and pray all of them to recover and um, uh, all of you to do a good job in that in the same way i thank all the participants who have been a part of this discussion and being joining us and i conclude the session thanking all of you thank you sir thank you sir. thank you thanks sir thank you